So guys, we're going to get started in a couple of minutes. If you guys have any questions before we get started, let me know. Okay. Welcome. Just send in when you get a chance. Sure. Okay. Three takes a break. Four and a half. I last Should I go slow? No, you're fine. Okay. <laughs> if I have a question, I'll raise my hand. Sure, sounds good. So guys, we're actually um, streaming this live on Facebook. So we might have some questions from John. Um, uh, he's gonna raise his hand if we have any questions. So um, I encourage you guys to ask questions, stop me at any time. And we're actually gonna get started in a couple of minutes. Yeah, thank you. And that's actually good news for you. So make sure you grab one of these journals. They're pretty nice. It's like a moleskin. Yeah. Yeah, this is a good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, in the interest of time, I'm actually going to go ahead and get started. Um, but like I said, if you guys are welcome to stop me at any time, if you guys have any questions. Um, how many of you guys are thinking of applying for fall? Fall 2020? Great. Okay. And is anyone here applying for spring 2020? Gotcha. Okay. Great. Okay. Wonderful. So, a few fun facts about our program it is entirely in the evening. So, most of our students work full time, go to school part time. Um, most of our programs do not require the GRE. The only programs that do require the GRE is the Epidemiology and Biostatistics, the MPH, um, as well as the MS and MPH and Environmental Occupational Health. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Anita. I work in the admissions office. I'm the recruiter. Um, and if you guys have any questions, like I said, please feel free to stop me and we can go over anything that you want to go over. Again, um, I will only be covering the MPH. Is anyone here applying for the PhD program? Okay, wonderful. Um, so we're just gonna um, have you sign in, please, and um, just grab some paperwork. So again, my name is Anina. You guys should write down my email address, grab my business card. Any questions that you have, feel free to contact me anytime. So um, most of our students, as I mentioned earlier, are working professionals, they're working in the field, and they come to get an MPH. An MPH is a terminal degree. Um, that means that you don't need to get a degree after that. You're considered a professional in the field once you get the MPH. Once you take our MPH, um, since we're seed accredited, you can sit for the only professional licensing exam in public health, which is the CPH exam. So I like to tell students, as soon as you're done with the first 15 credits, the core credits of your MPH, you should go ahead and schedule your CPH exam because that exam is based on the core courses. 
So what is public health? Um, does everyone here work in public health? Do you guys, can you guys give me some examples of public health? Does anyone here work in public health? Yeah, what do you do if you don't want me asking? Um, I work for a nonprofit on um, a program that focuses on communicable diseases. Great, okay. Anyone else? Hi guys, welcome. So that's exactly what public health professionals do. You know, we work with populations, right? It's all about population health. That's the quickest, most simple <coughs> definition of, uh, of public health, in my opinion. It's um, population health. So the, I like to share this, the 10 great public health achievements in the 21st century. Um, of course, vaccines. Um, we, we kind of take for granted public health is everywhere. You know, having safe drinking water, um, having seatbelts in cars, um, car safety features. These are all public health policies that were put into place to keep us all safe. So um, I just like to show these to people, tobacco control, maternal child health. Um, within the last century, that has uh, dramatically changed. Um, people, parent, like mothers are dying regularly. It was a normal thing, it was commonplace for um, women to die in childbirth, but that is um, hopefully gonna be a thing of the past. What do public health professionals do? Um, this is a very limited list of the professions that you know one can do with, a, with an MPH degree. Why come to CUNY-SPH? So as I mentioned earlier, um, our program is entirely in the evening. And you can actually do the first 15 credits online. Our tuition is the most affordable cost per credit in New York State. So we're about 544 per credit. And um, one thing I like to note is that we have a tremendous amount of student support. We have career counseling, we have advising, we have internships. We also have support with writing and math. So like you guys came here today, we have um, a couple of floors in this building. Come on in, guys. Um, we have the um, floors five to eight in this building. And accreditation, this is really important. So all of our programs are accredited. Um, we have additional accreditations for our masters in environmental occupational health, and as well as our DI. So when you guys are looking and exploring for schools of public health, it's really important to make sure they're all accredited. So these are all the programs that we have at the CUNY School of Public Health. We have three PhDs, five MPH programs, three MS programs, and three certificate programs. One thing I do wanna highlight is that we have two fully online Masters of Science programs. There are the global um, immigrant health, as well as the population health informatics. These are completely online. They're uh, masters of science. They do not require the GRE. Um, and they're um, very interesting. So if you guys are specifically interested in any of those, let me know and we can go over it. So again, this is a list of all of our MPH, MS degrees. We also have a specialization in maternal child reproductive sexual health. That specialization you can actually add to any of your degrees. So what happens is um, we replace your, your um, elective credits, your field work, as well as your capstone will, base in, will be based on maternal child reproductive sexual health. So for example, you can come in and get an MPH in community health with a specialization in maternal child reproductive sexual health. Our certificates, we also have three certificates. Um, our most popular certificate is our advanced certificate. Our advanced certificate is the first 15 credits of our MPH program. So a lot of students like to start with the advanced certificate and all the credits are actually directly transferable into any of our master's programs. And that's actually fully online as well. So you could come in here, um, take it fully online or in person um, and then transfer those credits into any MPH or any MS. This is the curriculum of our um, MPH, it's 42 credits. Like I mentioned, the core coursework, which is the 15 credits you can take in the, in the advanced certificates. 
then the remainder credits are really the required coursework, the electives, the field work experience, as well as the capstone, which is the culminating experience. Uh, as I mentioned, this is basically um, the first 15 credits of the program, the advanced certificate in public health. How long will it take? So the average student who's working full time will take probably two classes a semester. If you do that, it takes anywhere between two to two and a half years. Come on in, guys. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, the MS program is 33 credits, and the, like I mentioned before, the cert certificate is 15 credits. Classes meet once a week, and all classes are in the evening. So they start, very rarely do they start at four o'clock, but mostly they start at six o'clock and eight o'clock. Classes are Monday through Thursday. We don't have classes on Friday or the weekends. And as I mentioned before, we do have online classes. So most students graduate within two to four years. Um, we do have classes year round. So classes are in the fall, spring, summer, winter. Um, during the winter session, uh, which is a one month session, um, we generally have very few limited um, availability. But in the summer, we have a little bit more availability. So the field work, um, the field work is generally taken um, after your first year. So a lot of students will complete the first um, 12 to 15 credits and then they'll take field work over the summer. So the first summer, they'll only sign up to field work and they'll do, a bit, do their field work for 180 hours then. So it's a supervised field work. A lot of students want to do it at their place of work, but I highly recommend if you can find somewhere else, um, I advise you to do that. I think it's a good opportunity for you to get experience somewhere else. Um, maybe work in an organization you've always wanted to work for, but I'll go over the field work a little bit more in detail. Does anyone have any questions so far? The field work. I mean, you said you'd get to it later. So I'm just curious how it breaks down for full timers because I, like, I'm a social worker now yeah. and I work a typical nine to five. So generally speaking, um, you would come up with your own schedule with your site supervisor, all right? So we're not asking you to leave your job, right? Like I said, most of our students work full time. So generally speaking, you'll come up with a, a different schedule to make up these 180 hours. That's why people do it over the summer because they have more time to do it. You know, instead of doing it over the week, uh, over the weekdays, and within 15 weeks, it's kind of hard to do it. Whereas if you have it over the entire summer, and that's the only class you're taking, generally speaking, you have a little bit more flexibility. Just some examples of our past field placement sites. We have an extensive list online, and um, after I go over the PowerPoint, I'm, I'm actually going to go through our website a little bit to help you guys navigate and take a look at everything. What do our graduates do? Um, I think this is important. Probably the most important, my, my favorite is they develop policies to promote health and prevent disease. They help assure the communities have access to appropriate and effective public health and health care. And of course, they assess and monitor the health of populations um, at risk for disease. So this is actually a, a data based on our alumni that just graduated. Um, where do they work? Where are they working? As you can see, a lot of them are working for the Department of Health, um, in um, hospital settings, private sector, or non-governmental organizations, which um, we actually have a list of. So one thing that we're really proud of is 94% of our alumni are either working or pursuing further education within six months of graduation. 93% um, of our alumni would recommend our programs to a uh, prospective applicant. So the non-governmental organizations are listed below. This is a very limited list. We're, we're not including everything, but, and the other, um, is basically also, you can see it's made up of mainly hospital organizations. How do you apply? So our application is completely online. It is done through SOFAs. We do not accept applications any other way. Um, so make sure you guys start your SOFAs application. It's in SOFAs.org. All accredited programs are actually, uh, you apply through SOFAs. It's a common application, meaning that you submit one application um, and your references, also known as your evaluations, will actually go to every single school. 
So when you're submitting your service application, you want to make sure that your references are not school specific because everyone gets the same references. The only thing that's different for your application is the personal statement, right, for each school, as well as as well as some school specific questions. And if I get a couple of minutes in the end, I'll actually go over the application with you guys. So um, we are still accepting applications right now for spring 2020. Spring 2020 starts the end of January. The deadline is December 15th. Um, is anyone here thinking of applying for spring? Okay, come see me when you guys are, are, are uh, after the, the session. Fall 2020 deadline is March 1st, 2020. Again, how do we apply? So for this. So the application fee, it's $135 for the first application, and then it's $50 for each additional one. All of your official transcripts need, actually need to be sent directly to SOFIS because SOFIS is going to be verifying your work. Um, the personal statement is also on SOFIS. It's, we recommend 500 words. Um, the letters of recommendation are also electronic, all submitted online through SOFIS. And we ask that you provide us with a resume um, as well as show us some evidence of um, having background in the field, right? So what we mean by that is we want to see at least some academic coursework in public health, but if you don't have that, then we're willing to accept like work experience. And the work experience could be internships, externships, volunteer work, it doesn't matter. Okay, so now it comes to the best part, the standardized test scores. We do not require standardized tests for any of our programs except for the Environmental Occupational Health, um, the MS, the MPH, and Environmental Occupational Health, as well as the MPH and Epidemiology and Biostatistics. Is anyone here um, uh, an international applicant that has any education from um, abroad. Okay, so in that situation, you're going to have to um, submit a transcript evaluation, um, and we accept either West or ECE or even Globe. Okay, so West is preferred because it goes directly to SOFAs, um, and then um, you may need to provide a TOEFL if the language of instruction was not in English. Okay, if you have specific questions, we can go over it in the end. And these are some additional admissions requirements per program. Um, again, everyone here who showed up will actually get a copy of this presentation. So don't worry, but we can go over it um, briefly in the end if you guys have any specific questions about the requirements. Um, like I said, the requirements are very, um, we're very lenient towards the requirements. We're, like I said, we're, we're willing to accept experience as well as academic coursework. Right? So someone who may not have an academic background in public health, if you have 10 years of public health work experience, we may be willing to overlook that you don't have a statistics class or you don't have a policy class. So how much does it cost? Um, if you lived in New York State for one year or more, and that's 365 days, and if you can prov provide evidence of that, then you can pay New York State resident um, rates. And that's five forty-five per credit. And if you're an out-of-state or non-New non Yorker, you're going to pay nine thirty per credit. So one thing about New York uh, um, our tuition is, after you register for twelve credits or more, you actually pay pay a flat rate. So once you register for 12 credits, you're only going to pay $55.45 per semester. So generally speaking, our students do not take 12 credits at a time. But if you did, you would only be paying a flat rate. So if you took 12 credits, but you're actually registered for 15, you would only keep paying for the first 12 credits. Again, we do have some great scholarships. We have the Dean Scholarship. There is no need for you to um, apply separately. We take a look at your SOFIS application and we determine your eligibility based on SOFIS application. 
We also have the mayor's um, graduate scholarship. So you actually have to apply for that separately. Is anyone here applying for that? Okay, so we'll go over it in the end. So how to apply for the advanced certificate. If you guys want to start with the advanced certificate, for the advanced certificate, you actually apply through Selfless Express. It's a much quicker application. It's a $50 application fee. The only thing we need is your resume, unofficial transcripts, and personal statement. So um, that's also a good way to start if you're really not sure which, you know, department or which area of interest you want to work in. Again, I just mentioned this. We uh, It's a $50 application fee, unofficial transcripts, the resume, a personal statement. And if you are an international student, we will need the TOEFL as well as a transcript evaluation. So financial aid, I encourage everyone here, um, if you are a US citizen, to apply for FAFSA because sometimes that's the only way you know if you're eligible for other benefits or other scholarships. So everyone here should apply for financial aid um, using the school code, it's 004765. And if you're applying for fall 2020, you're going to be applying for the FAFSA um, 1920, and that year 19 to, to 20. If you guys have any questions, uh, always email. You can always email financial aid at sph.cuna.edu. I encourage you to email them after you're accepted because we cannot tell you your financial aid until after you're accepted um, and after you're registered for classes. So once you guys are registered for classes, um, if you guys have specific questions about financial aid, and financial aid at the graduate level generally is unsubsidized loans. Also, I want to direct you guys to my website. Our website is actually very thorough. Um, we have a lot of FAQs there, and there's a lot of ways for you guys to get in touch with me. You're able to make one-on-one -on -one appointments with me. We also have weekly chat sessions. So if you guys are ready to submit your application, but you have some specific questions, you can chat with me. You can, um, you know, make a session with me if you have a specific question that you guys want to go over. Um, that's also a good way to do it. Those sessions we can actually do in person. We could do it over the phone. So um, I'll go over that. So before I get started on the FAQs, does anyone have any questions? Are you going to talk about the PhD programs? I'm not going to talk about the PhD programs, but I can talk to you after. Okay. Yeah. Are you applying this year for fall 2020? I haven't taken my um, GRE. GRE. Okay. The other one is expired. Yeah. Okay, we'll talk about it. Um, yes. Um, uh, one question about the certificate program, is that a rolling start or are there deadlines for when you're starting that? So the deadlines are similar to our MPH, it's December 1st for spring 2020 um, and then March 1st for fall 2020. Okay. Could you, could you mention to, about the chat, like just talk directly to the camera and say if you have any questions. Oh yeah, guys, if you guys have any, hi everyone. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to join in at any time. Um, we're just gonna go through the FAQs, but please feel free to ask us any questions. Thank you. Okay, so this is a very, very, very popular question. So if this needs three recommendations, but CUNY SPH only needs two, what do I do? So in order for your application to be deemed complete by SOFUS, you need to submit three recommendations. And let's just say, for, for example, you don't have three. You can actually submit up to five recommendations, but if you don't have um, a third, Right, let's just say you only have one or two. First, let's go over the types of recommendations we accept. There's two types. We accept academic references as well as professional references. Um, academic is generally from, you know, a professor or maybe an advisor who knows, who can speak about your entire academic career or a professor that you've worked closely with previously who can talk about maybe your technical skills and abilities. I mean, if it's going to be from a professional, it has to be from a supervisor. And again, it should really highlight any technical skills and abilities, right? It shouldn't be very generic. It shouldn't be about how you know you're prompt and you're on time. All of those things are wonderful. They don't really help us make a decision on how um, you would perform in graduate school or in a graduate program, right? So we need to hear a little bit about your technical skills, your abilities, 
any um, transferable skills you may have. Let's just say maybe you're not working in a public health related field, but something very similar, right? Maybe you're a program manager for, you know, an organization, right? But you have the technical skills and abilities, the know-how, maybe you've handled grants <coughs> before, maybe you've helped develop policies before, but it's not apparent in your role that you've done that. So it's important that we know that you're, you've done that. So, how about people that left school a long time ago now? Yeah. Which professor do you meet? That's a great question, actually. A lot of our students may have been out of school for 10 years, oh. and there's no way we can track down those professors. Mm -hmm. So in that situation, of course, we understand if you submit to professional. Okay. Yes. How about volunteering? Does yeah, absolutely. We do accept um, references from anywhere you volunteer that can speak about your technical skills, your abilities, um, your leadership in public health. That's very useful. Um, so again, the types of um, recommendations or references or evaluations that we accept are academic or professional. One of each is very useful, but again, we understand if you can only get a professional or if you can get only academic. Um, so for the third one, what I like to tell students is if for some reason you can't submit a third one, you can put down a name and an email address of a friend and tell them to take no action because we don't accept personal references. Okay, so minimum we need is two, um, but SOFAS needs three. So for the third one, if you can't get a third one, you just put in the name and an email address of a friend and tell them not to submit anything. So they just don't do anything. But on SOFAS, it looks like you made a request for a third one. Okay. So if you are going to apply to one of the programs that have a GRE requirement, we don't have an official GRE minimum score. But ideally, you want to score somewhere in the 50th percentile. Okay, that's a competitive score. Um, that's generally the, the score of our accepted students in the program. Can I submit my application without standardized test scores? Yes. You can actually submit your application without the following three things. You can submit your application without your test scores, without your references having been submitted, and without your transcripts having been received by SOFAS. So you just need to submit your personal statement, your um, program specific questions, and um, that's it. And then your, your, your application, you can submit your application, we can wait for the test scores, we can wait for the references, we can also wait for um, the transcripts to be evaluated by SOFAS. Is anyone here taking the GRE soon? <laughs> we'll, we'll talk. Okay. Where do I send my transcripts? Like I mentioned before, we do not require transcripts. All the transcripts go directly to SOFIS. SOFIS is actually going to evaluate them and confirm them. So um, make sure that they're submitted on time so that and they're, they're submitted before the deadline. So SOFIS has plenty of time to review it make sure it's correct. A big component of the application is you actually entering every single undergraduate course that you've taken. So that takes oh, a lot of time. In, but, me, sorry, in life? Yes, in life. <laughs> <laughs> you could pay SOFAS to enter the, these for you. Um, I'm not sure of the cost, but you know, generally speaking, I tell students, you can do it yourself, you know, unless you have 10 to 15 institutions you've been to, and I understand. But um, yeah, that's one of the things. So you have to enter every single undergraduate course that you've ever taken. Um, and then SOFAS will actually go through your records and, and, and verify your records. Yes. You also have to enter graduate. You could. If you want us to make an assessment based on your graduate, we only make assessments for the MPH based on your undergraduate. But if you think that it's important that we see your graduate program, um, for example, if it's social work and you think it's relevant and it's applicable and you want us to see it, then by all means submit the graduate program as well. Yes. What happens in the event that you're still enrolled in school, but you already submitted your transcript? Yeah, that, that happens all the time. So, you send so yeah, so a lot of students are still waiting to graduate, or some people might graduate in December. Um, that's totally fine. SOFAS will make a verification based on what you provided, and it will say something like pending um, 
pending completion. So do you send the transcript again? You might need to. Okay. We Everyone is once you are accepted into our program, the admissions office does require an official transcript for, from you guys. Even though you guys sent it to SOPAS, we here at the admissions office, we do require an, uh, an actual physical copy of, the, uh, of your official transcript for your undergraduate program to confirm that you guys have graduated. So, because we need that for our records. So you need to get two copies of your transcript then, right? Yeah, so one has to be sent directly to SOFAs, okay. and one eventually will come to us. Okay. Okay. Um, what was going to ask? Um, you need a transcript from every, because I went to CUNY, so you need a transcript from um, community college and the four year school. Generally well. speaking, if you went to a CUNY, you just need to get it from the CUNY that you graduated from because it should include all the CUNY classes. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Did you have a question in the yeah, back? You just answered it. Oh, okay. How long will I have to wait to hear back from the admissions committee? So as soon as you submit your application, it still has to go through a completion phase. Because remember I mentioned you can submit your application without the test scores, without the evaluation, and without the official transcript being verified. So once it's complete, once it's verified, then our admissions office will send you an email saying, Thank you for submitting your completed and verified application. Now we have begun review. So at that point is when we start sending out your application to the admissions committee. So a lot of people submit their application in September, but they haven't taken their GRE. They're not planning to take it until November. So even if you submitted your application in September, we cannot review an incomplete application. We will have to wait for your GRE scores to start the review process. So I like to tell students at our busiest, busiest season, it can take us anywhere from four to six weeks to get back to you. It's generally never that late, but sometimes it could be. So what happens after you get accepted? You're, you're going to get an email from us. We email you your admissions letter. Um, then we, we request that you submit a commitment deposit. The commitment deposit is $250, and that actually goes directly towards your tuition for your first semester. And then we have an admitted students day where you meet all the other admitted students um, and orientation. That's where you register for classes. Um, and then um, you get to meet a lot of students. You get to meet current students, alumni, faculty members. It's really exciting. And this is my contact information. Does anyone have any specific questions for me? And if we were to get accepted into the, let's say, fall 2020, um, is there any option to defer enrollment? And if so, for how long? Absolutely. So you are allowed to defer. Um, we give you a one year. Um, yeah, in very rare circumstances, we, we uh, may allow you more than a year, but a year is generally the maximum because just in case, like, some, like, the admission requirements have changed or things like that, we may then ask you to reapply if it's after a year. I'm through so fast. If I were to apply over the next few months, can I elect to apply for like fall 2021 or something like that? Or did so fall 2021 will open in August. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So right now, the only applications we're accepting are spring 2020, which starts end of January, and fall 2020, which starts end of August. Yes. Um, I have two questions. Um, for one, I'm interested in the community health concentration, mm -hmm. and I know I personally, in my undergraduate degree, don't have a strong foundation in statistics. Okay. Is there any other way for me to demonstrate like work experience skills to be like parlayed to? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. I wouldn't worry about having. Um, you you said you did psychology. No, no, oh, oh. I didn't. So, do, you, do you mind uh, telling me what you did your undergrad in? If in you communications. Oh, yeah, you're going to be fine. Yeah. Okay, because some, um, I know some other schools require you take um, statistics if you never did in your undergraduate. Um, um, you know what? Send me an email with your um, transcript, and I'll be happy to just uh, go over it with the director of admissions just to make sure that you meet all the requirements. Okay, and then um, my other question is, because you, if you take the um, online certificate program and because you transfer those credits to the MPH, does that give you um, a better chance of getting into the program because you 
I mean, generally speaking, think about it, right? You're taking classes in the program. There's no difference between you and an MPH candidate, right? Um, it's a great opportunity for you to meet our faculty. Um, it's a great opportunity for you to test out our program. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of students end up getting references from the classes, from the professors that they have. Generally, those professors may also be in the admissions committee, so they're well aware of you. So I'm not going to say it improves your chances. It's not a guaranteed admission, but it generally, it, it vastly um, improves your chances because we see how you've performed in our, in our program. We have to fill out in the application all the courses that we took. So is it possible to get to download the unofficial transcript and then you fill it in that way? And then if and when we do get accepted, that's when we would purchase the official transcript to send it over? So yes and no. So yes, you can uh, uh, download your unofficial transcript to enter your classwork, right? But for SOFAs to, <laughs> to verify your application, you would need to send directly from your institution. You would need to make a request, right, to send official transcripts to SOFAs. Most of your application is never going to be verified or completed, right? So you don't need to open up a brand new, um, you know, sealed transcript and go and enter your coursework. But you do eventually need to send something called a transcript request form to your registrar's office. And that could be done, um, sometimes nowadays it's done online or you can go in on campus and make a request and they will send it directly to SOFAs. And I'm actually going to try and go over some of this with you guys. So you guys have a little bit more um, exposure. Has anyone here started their SOFAs application? Okay, great. Yeah. Um, what are like the sizes of the classes and how many students are in so um, we have a really wonderful student to faculty ratio. I believe it's seven to one, right? So for every um, seven students is one faculty member. Um, generally speaking in the core courses, you may have up to, um, we'll combine two sections. You may have up to 60 students in one of those classes. But once you get to your specialization courses, I have, you don't get more than 15 students per class. I yeah. have another question. Is there anywhere you can find um, descriptions of the courses? Absolutely. Okay. I'm actually going to start going through the website a little bit to show you guys some of our um, academic services that we provide, um, as well as the schedule and our academic calendar, because I think all of that's very useful. And then if we have a little bit more time, I'm going to try and go through the SOFIS application as well. And feel free to stop me at any time. For those of us that are joining us on Facebook Live, please chime in at any time. So um, I encourage all of you to check out our website. Okay, so the first place I really like to quickly go over is the admissions website, actually. So if you click on admissions, you can go over, our, we go over all of our application deadlines, December 1st for spring 2020, March 1st for fall 2020, we go over all the degree programs. And then, of course, you have opportunities to come meet with us. That's how you guys signed up with me here. But again, you can do a personal appointment, like I mentioned earlier. Um, virtual chats are here every Monday and Friday from 10.30 to 1.30. And again, you can always email us. Email is the quickest way for you to get in touch with us. And here is a list of all of our frequently asked questions. And it's actually um, sorted by content, so that's very helpful. If you have specific questions about general information, if you have application questions, financial aid questions, and if there's any international students, if you have questions about that. So that's our admissions website. Um, and now I'm going to briefly go over, um, under academics, actually, our academic resources. So under academic resources, we have our academic calendar. So that's always important. 
um, to take a look at. Um, so it's, for example, if we're starting in spring, we have a few closures. So the start of classes is the 27th of January. Um, well, college is closed on the 12th. College is closed on the 17th. And then you'll see some days like this Tuesday, the 7th, we follow a Wednesday schedule. So I always like to show students that kind of calendar so you know um, what days you have to come on campus and what days you don't. Again, we also already have our class schedule online. So if you look at spring 2020, you'll see this is the list of all of our courses. This is the course title. This is the credits, if they're online, if they're in person, the time, the instructor. They're all um, listed already by department. So I encourage you guys to take a look at that. Um, as well as if you click on CUNY class schedule, this is through CUNY First. CUNY First is our registration system. Um, you can view your tuition, your bill. That's how you register for classes um, and things like that. So this is the way that you can check our class schedule through the CUNY First system. And here we have some information about our field work. So if you guys specifically want to take a look at our field work, it's all here. Go to GPA calculator. So, and then I think the best part about our um, academic resources is probably our student academic support that we have. We have um, academic advising. So we have faculty advising as well as academic advising. Academic advising is basically to make sure you're taking the right classes, you're on the right path to graduate. But of course, we also have faculty advising where you're assigned a faculty advisor and you meet with them regularly to make sure that, you know, if you have any questions about your career, or research interests. And then, of course, we have writing assistance and tutoring. Yes, do you have a question? We have a question from online, yes. from the chat at Facebook. Brooke Sherry asks, can you receive multiple degrees from the SPH, like an MPH and the MS in Global and Migrant Health Policy? That's a great question. Um, I believe you cannot. Oh. But um, please email me at admissions at sph.cunit.edu for confirmation, only because I think you cannot be in two programs at the same time at a CUNY, but I could be wrong. So just please email me at admissions at sph.cunit.edu. Thank you for your question, Brooke. Thank you. So one thing that I mentioned that I really like um, is that we have writing assistance support as well as quantitative tutoring support. So if any of you guys have any questions or um, if you guys need a little bit of help with reviewing your papers, um, you know, like some uh, final proofreading maybe or brainstorming, or if you have questions about how to, um, you know, cite correctly and things like that, we do have a writing assistant on hand as well as um, someone who's here to help you with quantitative tutoring. So these student supports uh, uh, that we have in place is really great. We also share a library on campus. So I don't know if you guys know, but CUNY is actually one of, we are one of 25 campuses all over New York City. So with your CUNY SPH ID, you're actually able to um, go into any CUNY campus and study. So when I, when I was at Hunter, I, I did my undergrad at Hunter. I would go to study in Baruch, I would go to study in Queens College. So, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity for you to check out other facilities. A lot of our students go to City College, which is not too far from here, and they'll, you know, go to the library and study. But, you know, we also have lounges here. And another thing is that um, we have every single textbook that you would need here on the seventh floor out to borrow. So that's a good, good, I like to tell students that. Does anyone have any specific questions before I go further into the, um, yeah. Is there a minimum to be considered full-time, I'm sorry, part-time? Uh, a minimum a number of, of uh, courses or credits you have to be So, so we like to tell students to take a minimum of two, right? If you take a minimum of two credits per semester, then you're on the track to graduate uh, within the, the, or the required time. Most courses though are three each, aren't they? Two, cl two classes, sorry, two classes, two classes. so about right. six credits. Right. 
So a lot of students, um, when you come for your academic advising, you'll look at your program of study worksheet. And this is essentially, um, it depends by the department and the degree that you're getting. This will tell you, it'll tell you the four courses that you have to take, the concentration requirements, and then we go over the electives. Um, and then of course your field work and um, practicum. And then we make sure that you're on the right track. Does anyone have any other specific questions? I'm gonna see if I can um, open up a SOFIS application. Um, for those of you who started the application, have you guys started entering your coursework? I did everything. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is what the SOFIS application looks like. The first page that you go into if you click, it, you're going to get is this add a program page. And it is sorted by institution. So if you go by institution, we're the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. You click search. You will see um, all the programs. And as you can see, we have fall and spring here. So um, I have selected the FB for spring 2020. But you can select multiple programs. Like I said, this is a common application, right? So the pr first program is going to be 135 and each additional program is going to be $50. So then you um, go down to the bottom. Hmm. Oh, okay. Um, then you click on my application. So the application has four sections. The first component for your personal information is basically your biographical information. They're looking for your name, your um, gender, your citizenship information, your co uh, contact information, address. Some of this information is um, optional. Like for example, your family information, you can choose not to add it um, and that's fine. The way that you know a section is complete is if you um, see a little check mark here. You guys see the check mark? Mm -hmm. um, so the whole thing has to turn green, and that's how you know you've completed the entire section. Um, you go back to my. So this the, the first part of the application, like I mentioned, is really easy. Um, it takes about 15, 20 minutes, maybe. The second part of the application, the academic history, this is where you enter all the colleges you've attended in the past. Um, so yeah, you would enter the colleges, the semesters you attended, the type of semesters they had, was it a quarter, quarterly semester um, or a regular semester, what kind of degree you got from them. And then this is the transcript entry. So like I mentioned, you have to enter every single um, semester. And that does take a little bit of time. When you're, um, you don't need to add standardized tests. So um, for example, I would just click on not adding standardized tests in this section. And then the third section, we only require two things. We only require the recommendation. Like I mentioned, we need a minimum of three. Um, so if you create the recommendation, it's first name, last name, email address, when it's due, never to ever, ever tell them it is due December 1st because <laughs> then you, your application is not going to get reviewed. Okay, so I highly recommend that you t you meet with them as soon as possible because remember, they can submit the recommenda recommendation early. Right? As soon as you make this request, as soon as you put in their name, their email address, they can start submitting the recommendation, right? And I think they can do that before you submit the application as well, right? So what I tell students is take some time to meet with the person that is writing the recommendation, even if you work with them every single day, 
They might need to know which program you're applying to, so they know specifically what they need to talk about, what they need to say. Um, so they get a brief um, multiple choice um, questionnaire, and then they get a little bit of an open-ended section as well. So again, uh, it's the first name, last name, email address. The due date, very important. Make sure you don't tell them it's due December 1st. You know, as soon as you meet them, give them a two-week deadline. Right? So the sooner you meet them, the better. Um, under additional experiences, you can say um, you don't need to add these because we are going to be getting um, a copy of your resume. So um, under achievements, it's the same thing. The type of things they're looking for, and if, if there's something that you really want to highlight, it's awards and honors. But again, these should be on your resume. Um, if they're not, then you're welcome to add them. Um, I'm the same thing with experience, the type of experience they're looking for is employment, research, or volunteer. Again, these should be on your resume, but if they're not and you want to highlight something very specific, you can go ahead and add that. Under documents, the only thing we're looking for is your resume. Okay, so section three is super simple. It's the recommendations, minimum of three. And then under documents is your resume. Yes. I was going to ask, like, um, I'm not applying until like maybe like 2021. Can I make an account and just have it? Yeah, a lot of people do that. And fill it in because I don't want to do this like. <laughs> okay, so um, when you fill in your account ahead of time and yeah. you don't submit it, yes. there are certain things that will transfer over to the next cycle. Not everything. So don't request trans. Um, references and things like that. Yeah, like maybe like the academic history. Yeah, maybe some out. of the basic stuff. Just double check with SOFUS what exactly transfers over because I believe not everything transfers over to the next cycle. Okay, so okay. just be be mindful of that. Okay. So just give them a call or something, right? Yeah, you can give them a call. You can also send me an email if I, and I can verify that and confirm that information. Okay. Yeah. So the last section is program materials and this is based on all the programs that you're applying to. So here we go over the, the requirements of the program under documents. The only thing we require is the, the statement of purpose, your personal statement. Everything else is not required. We don't need to submit anything. We don't need a writing sample. The only thing we need is the statement of purpose. And then the last thing right here in this tab is questions. And these are institution specific questions. So they'll be different for, for every program that you're applying to. Yes. Uh, Lexi Martocci asks, can you also show the SOFUS application for certificate programs and the deadline dates? Sure, sure. I'll go over the SOFUS Express application. It looks very similar, but it's slightly different. Um, so yeah, I'll be happy to do that as soon as I'm done with this. Um, so the first question is, how did you learn about PSPH? And this question is really for me. So I know where I can find you guys. <laughs> A lot of people, you know, you guys hear um, from our colleagues from you know, employees from people who are in the program or even a Google search, you know, this just makes my life easier. I want to know how to find more people, right? How to find more qualified candidates. So this is a really useful question for me. The second question is also very useful and I like to highlight this question. Is there anything in your application about which you wish to provide further explanation in order to assist the admissions committee? This is a really good opportunity for you to address something, whether it's positive or negative. Right? It doesn't necessarily have to be either or. You could also leave this blank if you don't think you need to address anything. But it is an opportunity for you, for example, if you wrote a very strong, impelling personal statement and you don't want to bring up maybe you had a couple of bad semesters in undergrad, maybe you should address it. Right? I always tell students it's better to address something than to leave it blank because we will see it right and we'll be like what happened here it's better for you to address the situation and maybe explain to the admissions committee um and maybe it won't be a good opportunity to do it in your personal statement so we, we give this open-ended question it is limited to 500 characters um but we do give you guys an opportunity to to either highlight um a strength or it's more <coughs> weakness Um, the third question is, what is it about CUNY SPH and our mission that attracts you to us? This, the admissions committee is interested on in the research that you've done in our school. Um, the fourth question is, how long have you lived at the address that you listed? This helps us with determining your residency. 
Um, if you've attended a community college in the past, please give us your ample ID. If you haven't, you can just leave it blank. And this is a question also that we just use for research purposes to which other public health schools or programs are you applying to. Um, it's just useful for us to know. We actually do get that information at the end of every cycle, which other programs we might apply to, but it's also useful for us to know um, generally. And then the last question is, will you require an F1 student visa? Okay, do you guys have any questions? I'm gonna start going over the SOFAS Express application. It's a lot quicker. It looks exactly the same, but it's a lot quicker. But um, do you guys have any questions? Yes. Is there a certain format that you're looking for for the statement? Sir? Yeah, so if you go onto the website, actually. Um, I actually have a really great PowerPoint. It is minimum 500 words, but I like to tell students that 